making your health last, keeping your glass half full. This is a pretty young audience, but I hope by the end I'm going to have engaged you in this conversation because we're talking about the people that have borne the brunt of everything else that everybody else has talked about tonight, genetics and the environment. And by the time you get to be this age, two-thirds of what happens to you is determined by your environment and your exposures to things that um, could prevent you from having a more frail existence as you get older. So uh, there's a lot of statistics in this uh, 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 chart here, but what I want to show here is that um, with aging of the population and that bulge there that's moving up through as the boomers going through. But I think the most startling statistic in all of this is that right now in the world, there are more people over the age of 65 than have ever reached that age in the history of mankind. And that's happening because of that bulge that's coming through. And this is what we spend, this is age on the bottom of this slide increasing. This is what we spend in, capita, in Canada uh, on a per capita basis for health care as our population ages. And look at the quote at the top of that slide. Mismanagement of seniors' health and antibiotic-resistant bacteria are among the greatest risks to the global economy. This requires everybody's attention to what is going to happen in the future. This is a slide I put together um, several years ago now. Um, I just want to start at that top line there in the 1980s. Um, I actually went back to medical school to become a geriatrician. I also do bench research, which I'll allude to a bit tonight on the aging immune system. But I went back to medical school to become a geriatrician because I spent a couple of years in high school as the housekeeper on the geriatric ward in the local community hospital. And at that time, in the early 80s, we were spending a lot of money and focus in healthcare on curing cancer and fixing heart disease, and we could raise all kinds of money for research to accomplish that goal. And I saw these older people living on chronic care wards for the ends of their lives and understanding that how are we going to get the focus on that? Because nobody would wish that that would be how they're going to spend the last years of their lives. And we exist to find meaning in our lives. And it's pretty hard to do lying in a hospital bed in a hospital gown with, four bed, with the bed rails up. So how are we going to change that? Well, in the 1990s, um, we started to see, it, recognizing that uh, the lifespan is finite, um, we started to see a shift in the age at which people were starting to become frail, those, those red figures on that slide there in the 1990s. And when I give this talk to the medical students, those, uh, the, uh, the reason for that shift, I ask them, what do you think? that that shift was due to. And everybody thinks it's all the great inventions in medicine and all the technology. And what did we do in the 90s that helped to make that shift in the years to, uh, that people spent in a disabled state? Exercise, diet, smoking cessation, and vaccination programs. Nothing to do with the wonders of modern medicine. And so, as we've moved into this millennium now and recognize that I was that high school student in the 1980s, now here today to give this talk, and where we've come to, and I just want to acknowledge the fact that the Health Sciences North Volunteer Association created a research chair to bring me here to Sudbury to do something about this problem. So I want to focus on these yellow folks here on this uh, continuum as we're trying to compress morbidity or add life to years. I want to focus on those yellow people. 
because these are most of the older folks, about 80% of the population that you see walking down the street every day of the over 65 population. They have, 80% uh, of them have one or more underlying chronic disease, and 25% of them have three. Have we ever cured a chronic disease? No. <laughs> and so how are we going to figure out how to live more healthy in the context of the chronic diseases that we have as we get older? So this is the focus, and this is your choice. Could you... Uh what will your last 10 years look like? Will you be quick enough for a game of tag with your grandchild? Strong enough to embrace every moment. Will you grow old with vitality? Or get old with disease? It's time to decide. The average Canadian will spend their last 10 years in sickness. Change your future at makehealthlast.ca. So now I'm going to tell you how to do that. <laughs> so when we look at the determinants of health as we get older, um, obviously, we put a lot of focus on the physical. That's what we see, the physical health that everybody enjoys. So we talk about our confidence and our mobility and to be able to get out and do the things we do. But underlying that is the whole ability to make decisions. Your competence in decision-making ability is a key component of your ability to stay healthy. How do you continue to make healthy decisions? But, and we focus a lot on the physical part in medicine. Sometimes we talk about the, uh, the, the cognitive part of it, especially when we start to uh, have memory changes as we get older. But the thing we forget about is, remember I said that we all exist to have meaning in our lives. And this whole thing about staying connected to your families, your communities, becomes every bit as important as those other two in keeping your health as you get older. And so when I see older people coming into the hospital that have absolutely no one else in this community to support them and trying to find help that person still find meaning in their life, they have a huge risk of having a poor outcome of that hospitalization. So our social networks in our communities, or in other words, healthier communities, become critical components in a time now where families are often dispersed far and wide and not there at the moment that that older person might need them. And so when we think about this in terms of, I've now put my stick figures on this slide, and this is just to show you what happens as uh, your um, health declines as you, as you get older. And if we talk about now uh, something called inflammaging. And so this is the way that when we're younger, and we have, for example, an infectious illness. Um, our body be, uh, develops an inflammatory response to try and get rid of that. But as you get older, you can't turn off that response to those stressors. And so the inflammation is like this smoldering fire inside that's gradually making us decline, and that is associated with the progression of all chronic diseases. And what I'm showing you there is increasing frailty as you get older. And remember, we can't cure these chronic diseases, or we can't yet cure these chronic diseases. So how do we uh, change that to your glass is now half full? And the health promotion things are exercise, diet, smoking cessation, and vaccination. Those are the things that help us to turn that around to make the glass half full to be able to take on the next challenge uh, to our health. 
And if you go into hospitals these days, and from what I've told you, you'd think that every older person in the community must be in that hospital at some point, because how could you ever get all those folks in there that seem to be the, the, uh, the older people from the community? Well, in fact, if you look at the over 65 population, this 43% of them have never had a hospital episode. So we have people in the community that know how to do this. And we have people who are consistent low users. So you can imagine that every once in a while we might need a hospitalization for something. Um, but, and, and then we have this other group that are inconsistently the high users. So they come in for one problem, we treat it for over a couple of admissions, and then they're back out in the community again. But we come to this group here, the consistent high users of the hospital admission. And that's a different group of individuals. These are not the yellow figures anymore. These are frail seniors who are coming to the end of their lives. And we have this whole thing that we think is going on. It's that, you know, you come into the hospital and we hold out this promise of a miracle. And when the miracle doesn't happen, and we want that for everybody, when the miracle doesn't happen, we start talking about end-of-life care. And the families say to us, but wait a minute, we picked the miracle. And we have to understand that when our health state gets to the point we are so frail that any little thing brings us back into hospital, we have to understand that that is coming to the end of somebody's life. And if you, in the RAND Corporation survey, if you look at people's greatest fears as they grow older, it's not death, that's way down there. They fear becoming dependent and having to go to a nursing home. So we have to design healthcare systems that understand that that older person would actually rather have a good death than be put through another cycle of treatment or something that is not going to change the inevitable and has a significant impact on quality of life. And uh, you uh, heard this statistic earlier, and I've given you all these numbers, but this is the problem, is that the reason why one in three older people admitted to acute care hospital are discharged at a higher level of disability is because every day you spend in bed, you lose up to 5% of your functional muscle strength. That means after a 10-day hospital admission, you have half of your strength left. No wonder you can't get up and walk away from that hospital admission. And we have somewhere between 25 and 30% readmission rates of these folks. So man, if we didn't get you the first time, we'll get you the second time coming in. And how do we prevent that cycle from beginning to happen? Well, this is what we're really looking at is we're looking at the health of individuals as they come into hospital. And, and what can we recognize about their underlying vitality? And not to look at that older person on the stretcher. They all look the same, older people all look the same when they get sick. And this is what I, I want you to just uh, take home from this, because you're, you're going to be in the emergency department in the hospital if you're close to your grandparents or parents sometime soon. And what you need to let them know is how you were doing before you got sick, because everybody looks like they've been in bed for a long time by the time they're in emergency with that health problem. So you need to let the healthcare providers know that you were out golfing last week, even if you're in the emergency department. You don't feel like that person you look. So this is the whole thing is get you back to where you were before you got sick and recognize when the end of life is coming. So the challenges of a healthy a, to health aging in, of the population that we need to know what we have to do to remain active through life 
Exercise, diets, smoking cessation, and vaccination are the key public health strategies. And to recognize that dynamic frailty needs to be addressed and we have to design our hospital systems to restore vitality to older individuals. Thank you.